At last. I'm not a computer nerd. I am uh, uh, very bad at computers. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tommy, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, indeed, I am not a musicologist, and uh, I'm talking about music as a hobby. I started collecting records from a young age and got interested in jazz and various other fields. And the Grammy nomination actually was for something completely different. It was about recordings by people of African descent in Europe uh, before the 1920s, 1890s to 1920s. Uh, at the end, I didn't get the Grammy because uh, the Americans preferred an American uh, but such is life. Um, I am a hobby historian and a discographer. Now, perhaps I should explain what a discography is or what a discographer is. Uh, you're all familiar with books, and um, a listing of books is called a bibliography. And the National Bibliography aims at uh, collecting all data about books published in a certain country. And by analogy, a discography is a systematic listing of sound recordings. And a discographer is the one who is um, carrying out that job, that task. And uh, so, um, Bibliography and discography are similar in terms and in aim, but they are completely different in uh, the technology applied. And so we need to work like uh, Sherlock Holmes because there's no written evidence really. And most of the information has to be recovered from discs that we find or do not find but we know about from uh, uh, published sources such as company catalogs, for instance. So um, I am uh, interested in record labels as a discographer. Why? Because labels of a, of a uh, company change over the years. If it's a long living company, then there are many different labels from the beginning towards the end. And a, when I see a label, then I know in which year this particular record was recorded. So I'll treat you to some uh, labels uh, during uh, this talk. So I'm sure you will be bored, but that is uh, how I work. I will talk about um, the Baker Company's trip around the world, which took place in 1905. Now, um, the first gramophone recordings date back to the 1880s. The first commercial recordings really started in 1898 or 1900. So the recording industry is a very recent industry. And uh, you all know Nipper the dog and his master's voice. So uh, that was the largest company at the time. But there were many smaller companies. And one of the smaller companies was Baker record. And you see at this uh, trademark application that the owners of the company were a Mr. Bump and a Mr. König. They used the two capital names, the two um, uh, letters of their last names, B and K, which in Germany means Baker, BK Baker. So um, they, um, they used it, they introduced their company in 1905. Four, entered the trademark in 1905. It was granted in 1905. And as you can see here, they were latecomers, really, because the, the, the competitors started in, in the late 1890s. But um, this company was young, and they were um, determined to enter the business. 
And so they started with uh, simple designs of labels. In 19, the first recordings were done in 1904 and then in 1905. And uh, they were eager to expand their repertoire. And in those days, uh, it was different from today. Today you have microphones and uh, modern equipment and the uh, performing artists go to the nearest studio and record there. Whereas in the old time, 100 years ago, the technicians had to carry all their equipment along and uh, set it up at local situations, at local uh, sites, and uh, had to record through a horn. So the recording process was similar to the reproduction of sound. You see the, uh, rec the reproducing horns up there. And recording was done just the same way. Um, you were talking into a horn, which would then produce sound waves, engrave that into a wax plate, which would then be processed in a rather complicated way and then uh, pressed into shellac records, which were then re-exported to the place where the original recordings were made. So um, the, uh, it was quite an effort. I mean, we take it for granted today that we can travel anywhere in the world within 24 hours. And the first explorers, I mean, uh, you may have heard the name of Alexander von Humboldt, who uh, traveled to Latin America in the 19th century. He needed uh, about uh, five to 10 years to prepare his voyage, then uh, spent another five years traveling locally, and then the rest of his life uh, writing it all down. And uh, so uh, situation has changed dramatically. Uh, and all this 100 years ago was made possible through the simultaneous invention of crucial technologies. Uh, photography was invented shortly before the uh, turn of the century. The recording of sound was uh, invented at that time. Uh, the railways were uh, constructed during the second half of the 19th century. The steamship was introduced at this about the same time. So you had the means of mass communication, including the telegraph, for instance. So uh, you didn't uh, depend on letter posts anymore. You could communicate rather quickly. And all that was helped by the fact that at that time, nobody needed a passport. It's difficult to, to grasp that today. But at that time, you could travel anywhere without a passport. And it didn't matter which nationality you were, or which race you were, or ethnicity, or belief. The only exception was, I think, Russia. Because Russia was um, a special, they had a special state religion, uh, uh, Orthodox Catholic. And the Russian Tsar didn't want to have his religion diluted by Jews. So he said, um, in order to make sure, that no unwanted uh, religions enter my country, he asked for passports. And uh, so people who had the wrong religion or the wrong faith uh, were not allowed to enter the country. Uh, still, um, you would need local contacts to do the recordings. And uh, the Baker people, um, had local agents and they exported their repertoire to countries all over Europe. And they then uh, continued to um, mount and quote unquote expedition around the world. That was in 1905. And so in October of that year, they started traveling the Balkans down to Istanbul, at that time under the name of Constantinople. And they went all the way around Asia to Japan, recording all the way. And then they returned via the United States where they didn't record. This was then the end of the trip, was a pleasure trip. 
Um, the first stop to record was Constantinople. From Constantinople, they carried on to, uh, as you can see on the map, it's rather small, but uh, at all the dots, they stayed overnight. And they went to Turkey, recorded there. I shall play a short excerpt. You see, they, they depended on local contacts to tell them what sort of performers would sell potentially because there was no past experience. That was the first time uh, a recording expedition went that way. And they would then select the performers and the, um, the tunes to be performed. And uh, so uh, all that needed a lot of advanced preparation when they carried on to Egypt, to Cairo, they planned that nine months ahead. And uh, there in Turkey, they had a special label made, as, a, as you see here. And uh, this was for a um, Sheikh Yusuf. Sheikh Yusuf at that time in the Arabophone countries was as famous as Caruso was among opera fans in, in Europe. So he was a very famous man. He knew that, and he asked for a tremendous sum of money, uh, which is unusual at the time, because most performing artists were not paid at all, uh, or very little. But he asked for a lot of money, and he got it. And then it was the middle of Ramadan, and the German technicians asked him to uh, perform uh, some uh, titles from the Quran. And because it was Ramadan, he was not supposed to do something worldly. So the Germans bribed an imam, a priest, and said, well, you do it at midnight, and uh, uh, we do it secretly, and they did. So recording was always a difficult task. I just play another excerpt from uh, that tour, and this is that famous man, Sheikh Yusuf. And he also had his signature inscribed in the wax of uh, the records. From Turkey, they took a steamer and went through the uh, Suez Canal, which was also recently opened to uh, Bombay, as it was then. And upon arrival there, they were very disappointed. Uh, for the Germans, India was tigers and Shangri-La and uh, you know snake charmers. And they found themselves in a, in a British city so, um, but they soon overcome their disappointment because they had local agents. And the local agents uh, told them uh, what to record and they had already in advance brought in people from Benares, from Lucknow, from other places. And um, they um, uh, recorded them on the spot and uh, the Germans noted that the dealers that would distribute the records were all Parsis. Uh, I've looked it up in the, uh, in the internet and I found that Parsis accounted at that time about 0.006% of the population in India. Yet in Bombay at that time, they controlled the trade in bicycles and sewing machines and talking machines and henceforth also for, um, for gramophone records. So they uh, did a lot of recording there, 
and uh, continued their travel to Calcutta. Uh, they had a stopover in Rangoon, where they did not record then, but they returned later. But uh, you can see on that image part of the equipment they had to carry along. Uh, the huge recording horn on top, the talking machines, recording machines, and then um, the, uh, the, uh, the recording was made on wax discs, on wax cakes. They had about that height and were oversized, and for each recording you needed one such cake. So if you set out on an expedition to record several thousand titles, you can imagine the, the huge amount of uh, luggage they had to carry around, always in danger of getting it uh, lost or damaged because of the heat, because the wax would not withstand heat. And uh, as soon as they recorded on wax, they had to send it back the fastest way by steamer where in Germany they would then electroplate and uh, further process the, um, the recording, which would then be sent back to the dealers in, uh, in the various uh, places in India. Now, um, in Calcutta, they uh, found themselves in what they thought real India, because uh, they were introduced to agents. So um, the agent in Bombay had an agent friend in Calcutta. The agent in Calcutta had a deputy agent, and he had a deputy agent. And he then had somebody who said, uh, I know what to record. So, and all wanted a share of the budget. And they were discussing all the time, and the Germans couldn't understand what they were talking about. All they knew, they want money, and all of them wanted money. So uh, they decided we appoint just one person, we promise him a lump sum, and then they went up to Darjeeling to have some good tea and told him, you sort it out, and when we come back, uh, you have rounded up all the uh, artists that you think should have been, uh, that we should have recorded. So um, by the time they returned, they could, um, they could do the recordings. Here are some examples. And uh, I'll start with one example that was provided by Suresh. Rush. Old man. I'm <laughs> 
All in all, they recorded a mind-boggling 300 plus titles, of which so far only a handful have been found. And that is a big, great shame, because this is India's national cultural heritage, which is almost forgotten. And we have now set us the task of trying to reconstruct the catalog of all the recordings done at that time. So the hunt is on. And thanks to people like Suresh and Sunny, we are slowly, slowly identifying one or the other of those recordings. And um, apparently that um, trip was sufficiently successful that the Baker Company people uh, went on a second trip a couple of three years later. And um, I mentioned the label design because we know when you see that label design, it was recorded during the first trip in 1905. And the label design changed all the time. Uh, we could listen to more uh, tracks if you would like to hear more. It's all on the, um, on the computer. And they traveled on, uh, they recorded, or um, they, they, they visited the musicians in Penang, which were not recorded, but they recorded in the Strait Settlements, and they recorded in Rangoon, they recorded in Batavia and the Dutch East Indies, and they recorded f uh, in, in Ceylon uh, upon returning there. And uh, the um, situation in uh, Ceylon at that time was completely different from what they had in India, where they were mostly uh, individual artists, whereas in uh, Ceylon they recorded um, opera companies or theater companies. And, so, uh, and they recorded them in their entirety. So uh, some titles, would require 60, 60, 60 recordings for just one performance. And uh, they would have companies of 25 people or more. And it was extremely difficult. I mean, we take it for granted today. You put a microphone in the center of the room and maybe one in front of each musician. At that time, they had just one, one horn. And it was extremely difficult. The technicians were highly paid to organize the sound into that small horn and still have a, uh, a suitable result. And so they had to regroup and reorganize the seating of the artist, which was quite different from live performances. And that is something that uh, musicologists and ethnologists today should take into account because what you hear on record was not exactly what you would hear in the theater at that time because of the recording uh, uh, situation. And again, one side of a record lasted for some three minutes maybe. And uh, so more often than not, they would not record 60 sides, but just one, two, or three, or four sides. And that meant uh, they had to cut pieces of the performance. So even though they are real recordings of real artists doing the real thing. It was not the real thing because it was abbreviated. And that is something that has to be kept in mind. Now, um, they went on to China. I have also recordings here on uh, what they recorded there. Uh, in China, they had special labels again, different from the ones they used in uh, in India, 
And in uh, Japan, again, they use different labels. So, but as a discographer, I know those recordings were made during that particular trip. And uh, that was the last uh, stay. And uh, they returned, as I said, via the United States. And uh, in, in China and in uh, Japan, they encountered uh, heavy competition from American uh, recording engineers who recorded for Victor at the time and uh, uh, already had a big share of the market then. So um, just to keep you happy and me happy, I show you some more labels as they changed over time. And all those are Baker recordings made in Asia over the period of, uh, say, 30 years. So, and me or I as a discographer, when I see those labels, know exactly when and where they were recorded. But I have now centered more or less on the expedition part of India. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rina. I hope it was uh, very informative for everybody. And he has given on uh, Becker expeditions uh, from Germany and other uh, records of uh, various uh, places and the travels and etc. The first what uh, those uh, people have taken on that uh, day. We have seen that mission is about 14 feet height. Uh, it requires a full bullock art to <laughs> Do you think uh, these days anyone will uh, take such effort? No, everything uh, they wanted uh, within this one. Eh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they want everything within this one. And if they can further reduce to a pen drive. Eh? Nothing more than that. No, that is it. <laughs> that is the last. So um, it was a wonderful session, uh, Doctor. And uh, any queries, uh, we shall be happy to answer. I'll try to answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very first label uh, which Vega came out with. Um, not, in, not in Asia, but I see the Heron singing, listening to the sound coming out of the horn. And later on, subsequently, changed over the period of time. So, do we have any information who were the designers of these labels and what signifies? Because why I am asking this question? Because in India, the dog and horn were not accepted in all states, so somewhere the design was changed. So was this a reason in different Asian countries that Iran was removed later and either a flag or some other decoration? Just a little bit of history about Iran. Yes, the very first label designs were very simple. I showed them just briefly at the beginning. They had no, no iconography really. And then for the uh, Baker expedition, they introduced special labels. They had a special label for Turkey, they had a special label for Sheikh Yusuf, they had special flamingo labels later on in, in India. And uh, the reason for that is that um, the, his master's voice dog was copied by many, many countries, uh, sorry, by many, many other competitors and they used all sorts of animals, a beaver or a, um, a parrot talking into a, a, a recording horn. And Baker, for some reason, chose a flamingo. Don't ask me why, but I'm quite sure it is a, um, their, their effort to circumnavigate being sued for uh, using uh, the nipper trademark, and they thought of something else. And uh, the dog trademark was not suitable for India anyway, so they chose a bird. And they kept that quite a long time, and they used it also outside India. And then when they continued on the first expedition to China and to Japan, the local dealers, uh, I think, were um, responsible for the label designs. They told the Baker people we wanted to, to, to be that way. And the Japanese flag is particularly interesting because it is the imperial war flag. Uh, why that should be on a, on a private recording uh, label is, escapes me, but... Uh, 
And the label design, if I remember correctly, was drawn up by a uh, by a company member. It was not a professional artist. The last slide which you showed about the Baker catalog, where there's a sphinx. Uh, <coughs> oh, that's an advertisement. Yes. From Egypt. 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 Yes. There were all these flamingos standing. Uh, yes. The I've seen a Baker catalog from uh, Egypt, and I recently uh, was able to purchase a postcard distributed by dealers in India, and they had a similar design. So they wanted to, to have something exotic, Arabic. There are no flamingos in Germany, except in the zoo. But, but one thing you'll find, that the flamingos are standing, uh, turning back, and then looking uh, what is coming out from. Yeah, yeah. The voice uh, is trying there, trying to listen to the voice. See, looking at that side, and then standing at that yeah. side, and then looking back. Yogi is standing on the <laughs> See, they, they, they were very clever in uh, uh, having a, a mimicry or a... Um, uh, a uh, they, were, they tried to, to avoid being put to court for imitating the, uh, his master's voice trademark, but they still managed to have a horn there and an animal talking into the horn but uh, by turning its head. And they added a Baker record, which looks like it was part of the machine. Yeah. Certain semblance. The piece of information that along with this book cover which is showing in green, that uh, book uh, or separately a complete compilation of our 20 tracks of this Asian tour is available now on CDs for anybody who wants to listen. <coughs> Yeah, that was our first attempt to um, recreate that tour on a CD reissue. Ah, that is our Society for Historical Sound Documents, of which uh, you, Suresh, and uh, Sunny are members. And uh, we uh, tried to reconstruct the history of recording companies in Germany and Europe and we have devoted an entire book to um, Baker, and uh, we managed to fill one CD only, but in India alone, there were more than 300 recordings, of which maybe four have been found so far. No, 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 four are in the uh, CD, but we all have about 150 discs. Do we? Scattered all around. From the first, from the first uh, trip? Okay, thank you for your attention and your kind applause. Thank you, Dr. Abrina. Oh, and on the topic of uh, trademark infringements, I have done an entire presentation on that with plenty of images of the various uh, mm, uh, uh, companies that tried to get close to his master's voice, but not, not quite. Some got sued, others got not. It's a very interesting topic.